Hello and welcome to Broken the Stigma. This is my second presentation in a similar format to my previous one, Breaking the Stigma. Um, this presentation is based on a research project I conducted during 2021 into uh, mental illness stigma within professional services. I was supervising this research by Dr. Chunky Moon of Leeds Beckett University. Um, who was fantastic to work with and I would highly recommend people working with him and the university in anything going forward. So, all professionalism is now out the window. Um, I always like to give two introductions um, because I just hate talking about what I do and I'd much rather tell people about who I am. Um, so, my name is Andy Solkeld. I am a geek, I'm a gamer, I love board games. Uh, my favourites are called Tomorrow and Fog of Love. I am tattooed, I'm creative. I live with my little black cat Pika from the picture, but also you can see her down, down here looking out the window. Uh, yes, she's named after a Pokemon and not an eating disorder. Um, she will probably wander around in the background, maybe find somewhere to settle down. Um, so keep an eye out, follow her. Um, I live with depression, uh, anxiety, and have experienced suicidal ideation. I'm medica medicated, I speak to a therapist, I'm a patient of IAPT, and I will always describe myself as a car crash of a human being, um, but I've accepted that and everything that comes with it. But on the other side of things, I'm also Andrew Solkelt. I'm a big four chartered accountant and corporate financier. I'm co-owner and director of a small tech business in Leeds. I'm a published author and my book, Life is a Four Letter Word, Mental Health Survival Guide for Professionals, uh, was recognized by CEO today as the number one book for understanding employee mental health. I've spoken at numerous global organizations sharing my lived experiences with mental ill health. And importantly now, I'm also a chartered psychologist or I will be as soon as I bother to fill in the paperwork and so on. And I'm one of only a handful of people in the UK who now holds a dual chartership as a chartered accountant and chartered psychologist. So I guess that means you could call me a psychountant. And it sounds mighty impressive, doesn't it? Um, but it's been a long story getting to this point. And it's been a long journey conducting this research. Um, so. A bit of a too long didn't read version is uh, COVID-19 happened and no joke, like with many, I very much struggled with what was going on uh, with COVID-19. It took a lot of what my life was away from me as it did so many others. Now, I know I come from a position of privilege. I know I'm lucky. I survived this, countless didn't. And I will never say that my situation was worse than anyone else's because it wasn't. But it did encourage me to want to give more back and to help more people who are struggling. Because I sat there struggling myself, but seeing people struggle with their mental health, with the loneliness uh, and isolation that comes with lockdown, um, being faced with um, perpetual periods of stress, from living in an uncertain climate and uh, building anxiety within the population and communities. And I wanted to do something more. And one of the things that I've always done in all my work uh, up until this point is I've always caveated myself. I've always said what I do is, and what I am saying is based on lived experience. And that's my personal experience. Um, I would always tell people that I was not a psychiatrist, psychologist, psychoanalyst, psychotherapist, psychopath. Uh, probably didn't need to mention the last one. Um, but I wasn't one. And if someone came to me seeking help and wanting to do and wanting something I couldn't offer, I would always refer them to a professional. And as I sat there, having lost um, my business, having lost my home, um, and having the only things left in my life being my family, my friends and Pika. I sat there seeing people struggling and thinking, how can I do more? And I thought, well, what if I was? What if I was one of these things? What if I was a psychologist and I could actually help people and 
share with people how to get through this from a different standpoint other than just lived experience? What if I combined that? So I begged and borrowed and scraped what I could together to do a psychology conversion masters at Leeds Beckett uh, with the aim of learning more about people and their interactions and about how they interact with and within business because that is one of the things I'm most interested in. I don't know what it means. I don't know what having this dual chartership will give, but my aim is for it to give more back to people and to help more people when they're struggling. Um, and this research is part of that. This is what's come out of it, and I share it freely in the hope that um, people can learn from it and can make changes because of it. But I want to just put this up here because this is the reality of where I am. This is the only duplicate slide between breaking the stigma in this presentation, and in fact, all my presentations, because I want to be honest with myself and with you. I do not have confidence in myself. I seek external approval, as many do, um, to feel that my work and myself is valued. I give what I do away as much as I can because then there's fewer points of rejection. Um, I want people to see what I do uh, with the hope that someday someone will turn around and say, you know what, we want you to work with us rather than me have to fight and struggle for every small and fleeting victory along the way. So whilst I may appear confident, whilst I may appear outgoing, and I may even appear like I'm enjoying myself, underneath it all, I'm none of those things. And the reason I say this, and the reason I always keep this slide in my presentations, is because so many other people out there feel exactly the same way. So many people are silent, and so many people continue on and struggle. And I want to try and give them a representation to show that people of all sorts get through life. We are all part of it. We all struggle, and it is just part and parcel of our lives nowadays. And I want to give them hope more than anything else. And again, a reason why I am trying to give more back. So a few disclaimers before we go into this research and so on. Um, this is a presentation based on my research project, but it's designed to be accessible. So some of the wording may differ slightly. Um, some of the kind of nuance and detail, a lot of the maths, a lot of the kind of statistics are left out. Um, the full report is freely available on my website. You can go and visit it. You can read the whole thing. It has all the academic references behind it. Uh, and I'd be happy to talk you through the detail if you would like. There it, this is a sensitive topic. Uh, if for any reason you don't feel uh, comfortable, please feel free to turn off this video, step outside, take a break, what, whatever suits you. Come back when you're comfortable or just head off and carry on with your day. No worries. There may be some bad language. I'm sorry, it's just part of my personality. Supposedly, it means that you're more honest, but I'm just giving you a fair warning in advance for people that may not be accustomed to it. There will be time for questions at the end. Clearly, that's hard in a recording session like this. Um, feel free to take notes. Um, you can email me, ask me, leave comments on the video or on my website, um, and just start with the conversation. But this is why it matters. This is why all of this matters. And it all comes down to our work environments. Professional services, um, so accountants, lawyers, people like that, um, it's a very demanding workplace. We work to an exceptional quality often far exceeding client expectations and within incredibly tight time frames. We often work long hours and go well, and beyond, well above and beyond what is required. It is a challenging yet incredibly rewarding work environment um, that I am proud and happy to say I was a part of. However, with that comes stress. Now, um, the Chartered Accounts Benevolent Association, so a charity set up for chartered accountants, recently published some statistics from a study they did where 32% of accountants feel stressed in their day-to-day -day life and a further 17% uh, 
been forced to take time off due to stress. Similarly, um, workplace stress has caused 42% of respondents to consider resigning um, from their current post, and almost 14% had actually handed in their notice because of workplace stress. So around 50% of uh, all accountants that responded um, are struggling with stress on a daily basis and it is causing them to consider resigning um, from their jobs. Similarly, Lawcare, uh, a charitable organisation focused towards lawyers in a similar vein, they recently published some stats where 23% of all communications with the charity relate to stress and a further 25% relate to depression and anxiety. So again, around 50% of communications relate to stress and mental ill health. So stress is present in our businesses and in our business cultures. But we kind of already knew that, like it's, it's part of our workplaces. The problem is that stress has been uh, shown uh, to be prognostic towards mental illness, mental ill health. And the, where there is a diagnosis of, say, a common uh, mental illness, such as anxiety or depression, often stress is also present um, beyond it. So stress and mental illness are connected. And what this means is that if stress is present in your workplace, part of the culture, then the mental health of your teams is incredibly important to you and your business, and that something should be done to support them. Employers owe a duty of care to their employees with regards to their mental health if they are exposing them to stress. But now, or the reason stress is such a problem, is because how our body responds to stress and how, this, the, how the stress response hasn't hugely changed a lot over our, over our years. And it doesn't really differentiate between the type of stress that we're experiencing. Now, a lot of people associate the stress response as being connected to the four Fs, which is fight, flight, fright, and fuck. Um, there, I said it. Um, where your body prepares itself to, uh, to combat a threat, flee, flee from a threat, cower from a threat, or well, you know, and the idea is that this is a swift response to deal with something in the, the immediate um, present, and then there is a period of recovery as a result. So when this stressor appears, your body goes through this, this simple process. Um, do you perceive this stressor as a threat? No? Carry on. No worry. Yes? Ask the next, next question. Do you perceive that you can cope with this threat? No, stress response. Yes, carry on. And what you'll notice is I talk about perception here. So it's not necessarily whether something is or isn't a threat or is or isn't a stressor. It's how you perceive it. And your perception can change based on your circumstances and so on. And the stress response that follows, um, regardless of threat, is largely the same. Um, but the important part is it's designed to be a short period of heightened state followed by recovery. Um, and in those moments, it actually boosts your bodily functions. The problem comes when stress is constant and the body can't recover from this state or it misidentifies whether something is a threat or isn't. So this persistent or chronic stress is where things get bad and there are numerous studies into how persistent and chronic stress can impact the body but it can do things such as lower your immune system impact upon your sleep lower your concentration uh, impact on your ability to heal from wounds um, chronic stress is bad now i'm interested in this from the from its connection to mental health and my experiences with it but the impact is far more wide-reaching and should be considered very serious by all employers. I entered doing this research with a bit of a hunch. So I've worked with numerous organizations, speaking to them and their leadership teams about mental illness, mental illness stigma, 
uh, and so forth. And what I kind of found is this disconnect between what the leaderships were saying and what the teams experienced. Almost every leadership team I've spoken to has been so supportive of their people, like willing to make as many accommodations as they can, willing to do whatever it takes to support their employees. And particularly within professional services, this makes a lot of sense because we differentiate ourselves by our people. Our people are the most important asset within the firms. Um, so looking after those, and I, I'm just pausing for a second because I realized I used the term asset and I hate the idea of people being assets. People are people. Um, but it shows how ingrained this kind of language is within our within our culture and within our businesses. So I just wanted to catch myself there. Um, but people are what make our businesses special and unique. Um, and all the leadership teams were so supportive. But then whenever I spoke to the people within the organizations, Many of them were still fearful about speaking up, about talking openly, about um, seeking help. And, um, and even when I described the results that we'll go into later of this study, many people were saying things like, yeah, but that's just what they say. It's not how it is, uh, and so on. So I kind of came into this with the idea that there was this idea of stigma and perceived stigma. What I found was... Um, was fascinating and there's so much so much more to it than that so firstly stigma is connected uh, to attitudes towards attributes of people um, and there are two primary categories which is the perspective of the stigmatizer and the stigmatized um, stigmatizer um, is concerned with kind of the primary mechanisms of stigma how is this done and these are stereotyping prejudice and discrimination uh, and these are often referred to as the holy trinity of stigma and so on and these broadly relate to how we think how we feel emotionally and how we act towards people displaying uh, an attribute or a characteristic so in context of my work someone with a mental illness how do we think about them how do we feel about them how do we act towards them the next we have the perspective of the stigmatized and this is what that individual with the attribute, so with a mental illness, has experienced, what they anticipate to experience, and then what they have internalized um, inside themselves. So a good example of this is where someone with a mental illness, so say anxiety, will say, I can't do that because I will have an anxiety attack. Um, and they limit themselves based on this sort of stigma attached to it and so on um, but finally and this is the bit that fascinated me there's a shared component this is uh, this is called perceived stigma and it's connected to societal and cultural beliefs um, or group beliefs um, so stigma is massively important in this particularly towards mental health because it remains one of the largest barriers towards people seeking help particularly with regards to mental health, but also with regards to many other things. People try to hide what they're struggling with um, because of fear and shame um, that they will either be attributed negatively. So, for example, someone says, I'm stressed, I'm having a panic attack, I can't do this. And then they fear that their boss will say, OK, you can't cope with this. You'll never be able to cope with this. Therefore, I, I won't put you up for promotion now or ever, um, or that they won't be able to get the help that they need, i.e. I can't cope with this, I need more resources, I'm sorry, we, we're not recruiting anymore, we can't give you anything. These are things people fear about, and in many cases, um, stigma is such a problem that many people report that the stigma of mental illness is worse than living with the mental illness itself. So people who could benefit from all the improving quality of therapies, treatments and support out there choose not to because of stigma. And this brings us full circle back to um, professional services. As an accountant or lawyer, 
in accounting practice or legal practice, it is a stressful environment. Stress can cause mental ill health. If stigma is present within these organizations towards mental ill health, it could prevent, seek, prevent people from seeking uh, appropriate help that could provide them with better life outcomes. So all of this matters because lives matter, because livelihoods matter. So I dedicated a year of my life to capstone the three years I had before in breaking the stigma to try to answer the really simple question, had we broken the stigma? So I'm now going to talk a bit about my research project, what it was, um, what the results were, and how it took place. So um, following the usual disclosures and stuff like that, um, I asked people to read a vignette of an employee as presented on screen now and then I asked them to answer some questions about their own attitudes and their perceived attitudes of others within the organization. There was no way for me to trace back to an individual or their organization and there was only very minimal demographic information connect, uh, collected such as age, length of service, sex, all of which turned out to have no correlation um, with the results. So. That's a bit of a background. Um, the vignette was really important um, because I wanted to make sure that it was stigma towards an individual and the, and the diagnosis they had not impacted by the quality of their work. So you'll notice the very last sentence, quality and delivery of their work remains unchanged. Because I didn't want people um, to attribute towards um, a change in work quality wanted it to be specifically towards a diagnosis. Similarly, I tried to keep everything gender neutral um, to allow the reader to set the context themselves. And you'll notice I mentioned a diagnosis in this. But when you read the vignette, I don't talk about a diagnosis. And that's because that was the experiment. So when people signed up, they were randomly assigned to one of three conditions. One where Sam confesses a recent diagnosis of anxiety, one where Sam confesses a recent diagnosis of diabetes, and the one you read where they don't talk about any diagnosis, so acting as a pure control. And I wanted to see if being diagnosed with a common mental illness resulted in a different responses to the study. Um, because this way it could be, there's the potential to identify a kind of a causal relationship. Does having a mental illness increase or decrease the amount of stigma presented towards an individual? And this, this is all done very similar to how A-B testing is done in marketing online to see which adverts are the most successful. Um, the questions people were asked were all based on um, a, a questionnaire titled the Managerial Stigma Towards Employee Depression Scale. Um, I adjusted... Um, I adjusted this slightly so that firstly, all the questions referred to a vignette. Um, so they all talked about like Sam um, to make sure it was brought back to their work context. And secondly, um, I adjusted uh, the second round of questions looking at the organization. So it no longer refers to I, it refers to people within my organization to see what a person's perception of others within their organization was. Um, the other good thing about this uh, scale is it considers the subcomponents, so stereotyping, prejudice, and discrimination, because what that allows you to do is it can provide real-world benefit back to organizations. So I thought I'd done something pretty special here. I thought I had figured out a great study that was going to yield good results in practice. Um, that could then be applied. I didn't want to do academia for academia's sake. I wanted my stuff uh, and my research to actually kind of have meaning and so that business could make decisions based on it. So everything I did was focused very much from a practical standpoint. However, with experiments like mine, for it to become generalizable to an entire population, so in my case, the... Um, the UK professional services workforce, you need to have a certain number of um, participants 
to provide you with the correct amount of statistical power. And for me, in this study, I needed around 160, um, but I got 59. And it was a real shame, um, but it was a very, very tough time, like um, because of, well, one, because COVID, trying to do this without ha having presentations, without um, going to in-person events, without gi actually giving people a questionnaire to answer, um, without being based within uh, an organization, stuff like that. Um, there's a lot of ethical requirements around these things where if you communicate with someone, you shouldn't communicate with them again afterwards because that could be seen as coercion um, and could invalidate results. So there's a lot of stuff around that. Um, and what it means is, um, well, firstly, if I were to do this again, I would love to do this with an organization and all their people because then you can actually see the meaning behind it, which is great. Um, and you can apply it to maybe not only their workforce, but also potentially all professional services. But it also means I just want you to take these results with a pinch of salt because um, because of that uh, statistical power, we can't generalize it. This gives us an idea uh, and it gives us an indication, but it doesn't give us kind of an absolute uh, and it doesn't give us sort of proof as it were. An actual slide, an actual real slide. So truly I am getting more professional in how I present these things. And these are the results, it's really simple. Um, and you can see that there's the three conditions, mental health condition, physical health condition, control condition, and the stigma scale ratings, and then the total and perceived stigma. Um, sorry, the actual and perceived stigma. And in general, the results are incredibly positive as an indication. So firstly, there was no significant difference between the diagnosis of a physical health condition, mental health condition, or no mention of a diagnosis. And that this is true for both present and per perceived stigma. And this is good. So this means talking about a diagnosis of uh, depression, anxiety, diabetes, or anything doesn't change how people think, feel, or act towards you. That's, kind of, that's a good thing. That's where we want to be. We don't want people to feel better or worse uh, uh, towards an individual based on something that's happening to them. So next, in both the present and perceived stigma, the primary subcomponent for, um, for all diagnosis is effective prejudice. Um, so this is how we feel about the individual. So this is an emotional response, not a thought response, a non-action response. This is about emotional feeling towards the person, affection. Um, and this is important when it comes to real world implications, which we'll talk about later on. And next, which again is fascinating, in all instances, perceived stigma is significantly greater than present stigma. So yes, everyone else is the asshole. And there's plenty of other, there's plenty of things that could be happening here. This could be a self-serving bias where people always rate themselves higher than other, other people. Similarly, negativity bias where they dislike the viewpoint of the world and so on. Um, it, there could be an ordering issue where because I asked, uh, and because I asked people questions about themselves first, that primed them, and then they got asked questions about their organization, um, they could they could change their mindset, but everyone would have to change their mindset equally and so on. Um, there's ways to adjust for that, um, but it wasn't included in this study because I wanted to keep it consistent. Um, but yeah, in general, perception is worse than, uh, than reality, which confirmed the sort of th sorts of things I was thinking about prior to undertaking this. But finally, and importantly, and as I said, you've got to take this with a pinch of salt. You've got to kind of understand that this isn't proof. This is just an idea. But when you compare all the results to the mean of the scale, on average, people disagree, disagree to somewhat disagree 
is all the statements um, of stigma being present within their organization, both indiv individually and in their perception of others, which is really good, okay? Clearly, we don't have proof, we don't have the statistical power, but it is a great indication that stigma towards mental ill health is decreasing. So did we do it? Did we break the stigma? Yes, no, we don't know. That, that, there is more work that needs to be done here. This is very much an indication and therefore more work needs to be done in the future. But it allows us to actually focus where we're doing things. Like, so the results give us ideas of how things can be improved. And what I'm going to talk about now is uh, some of those. We're going to start with a bit of context setting, which is what I affectionately refer to as the yoga paradox. So we live in an episode of House. And what I mean by that is that we treat symptoms rather than causes. Um, we know stress exists within business and within our business cultures. It's a given. We understand that. And Stress and stressful environments are often due to a lack of resource in one form or another. But ultimately, there are, there are only kind of two universal resources, energy and time. Everything is a manifestation of those in some form or another. We use money as a proxy of people's time, whether it's uh, on time spent doing something, time spent with previous experiences, um, to enable them to do something, etc., etc. And ultimately, if you want to lower stress, provide people with more energy or more time. Um, so, as I say here, hire more people, pay people an appropriate amount, or allow people more time to achieve what's required. Now, clearly, this isn't always possible. But, but those are the underlying causes. But what we do is we treat the symptoms of them. And this is where yoga comes in. Because... One of the great things is stress and uh, the stress response can be relieved through exercise and through things like yoga and like meditation, like everything that you will have been advised in the past. And I will never tell you not to do this because these are all incredibly important and they genuinely help. The problem is the underlying problem is still there. So whilst you alleviate the symptoms, the problem still persists. But here's the yoga paradox. I'm struggling with stress and I know I'm low on resources, whether it's time, effort, whatever. I'm overworked, I'm underpaid and I just don't know if I can get it done. I'm nervous about raising these struggles because of any potential stigma. I worry people will see it as an inability to cope. I'll be attributed negatively, anything like that. I then get told that the way to address these concerns and my stress and what I'm experiencing is through yoga which takes more time and more energy out of my day that is already time pressured and energy pressured. So the natural response is to say, I don't understand the, the real problem, the, the problem that persists even if I do those things, which makes you less likely to talk about um, the, the problem in the first place. And then it perpetuates because the people aren't the the decision makers who put on yoga classes and things like that aren't hearing that the real problem is that you actually need another person in the team or that you actually need uh, more resources to be able to do this or a new bit of software etc um these are the realities of it and i believe this is what is driving uh, a lot of the difference between perceived and present stigma within organizations now i can't prove it but this is this is part and parcel of the kind of um, the response and the underlying problem. There are countless things that we can do to alleviate the symptoms of stress, and they all have a place. But if you're struggling with work, if you are working a 90 hour week and you don't have time and you are not getting any adequate rest, then it's probably fair to say that maybe two people should work 45 hour weeks instead of one person working a 90 hour week maybe even three people working 30 hour week but if you don't have those discussions then no change can ever take place it's every business 
wants to make a data-driven decision. And there needs to be these data points to encourage action. So if you are struggling with something like that that can be solved in a work-related manner, please speak out, reach out. People will listen. This is what these leadership teams that I've spoken to want to hear. Now, this research study showed that effective prejudice or stigma driven by emotion was greater than stereotyping and discrimination. And this is where we get real world implications. Over the past decade, there's been a lot of education provided to people and organizations about mental health, cognitive biases, supporting people with mental illness. Um, it's been a common trend amongst all businesses, not just professional services. The world is kind of wise to it, particularly with COVID-19 and everything that has come from working from home, etc. Problem is that education is best served at um, addressing cognitive st stigma, which is stereotyping, which makes sense. You are taught something um, which therefore impacts the way you think about the way you think about uh, people and so on. And it makes sense from the results as well. We've wisened up. So the cognitive component of stigma that is present will probably be lower. And, and as a result, the stuff, everything we have in our businesses is kind of prioritized towards education. Um, and a lot of that, and again, this is where some of the problems come from. It. A lot of this, and it works with our health healthcare system as well. A lot of this is about help seeking behaviors. And what I mean by that is they require the individual who is struggling with their mental illness or whatever it is to kind of be the decision maker, to take the lead, make whatever decisions they need to themselves and then progress through whatever system and treatment there. There are helplines that you can call if you are struggling. There are drop-in sessions with uh, therapists, psychologists, psychiatrists. Um, there are educational resources that can be accessed everywhere on the internet. We have mental health first aiders that you can reach out to at any point if you're struggling. All of these are, require help seeking. And to an extent, this is all perfect because one, you don't want to force something upon anyone. They need to take the decision themselves to heal. I'm a, I'm a long believer that until someone is ready to heal, they will not go through a healing process in any form. But one of the problems is the last thing someone who is struggling wants to do, particularly if they're struggling with something they don't understand, is seek help. And particularly if there is stigma present, they are just not they're not in the position where they want to do that. So what we need to do is we need to facilitate that easier within our organization so that people are more confident in having those conversations. Now, all these things do with education and stuff like that. So keep mental health first, first aiders, keep educational resources, have helplines, have all of this. They are necessary and should wholeheartedly be continued um, because when someone wants help, that's where they'll go. But there are other ways to actually improve their position so that they are more confident, that they are able to take the action so that they can seek the help that will benefit them. And that is through contact. And this is referred to, it's referred to as contact interventions, but basically it's all about just meeting people with mental ill health or knowing people experiencing a situation with someone with mental ill health. This talk, this presentation, all of this, you are hearing this from someone with depression, with anxiety, with all of that. And this is in a way a contact intervention because you are seeing what someone with a mental illness is capable of and is capable of delivering. And what happens with this and with contact interventions is they are better at um, lowering prejudice. Um, contact um, can often result in people endorsing and perpetuating positive beliefs about mental, mental ill health. And it's been shown to be more effective than education addressing um, 
effective stigma. So, how do we do this? How do we have um, contact to enable people to feel better about everything and to be confident? So you can have people like me. You can have people like me talk and stuff like this. But one of the best things to do is to build upon um, our social identities. Now, we as humans, we can measure ourselves by the social groups that we are a part of. So we have a social identity. Um, and it's actually called social identity theory, where um, you define yourself by the groups you are contained of. And one of them is our work environments. And the way we do this is by having the people within those cultures demonstrate the characteristics that we want to become a natural part of them. So one of the reasons I'm so accepted within professional services is because I come from professional services. I'm an accountant at the end of the day. And therefore, the professional services community listens to me because I have lived this, I understand this, and I have been a part of that group. And therefore, as I talk about things, they listen. Other people can deliver the same content, but there is more of a connection between me and the and existing professional services people than say someone who has never been part of professional services. Oops, we've just had a pop-up come up. Never mind. Carry on. Um Right. So what does this do by having people within our organizations talk about what is happening what they have experienced we start creating um, those attributes as cultural norms and by creating them as a cultural norm um, they start becoming acceptable and when they are acceptable people suddenly start feeling more confident around those and demonstrating those those characteristics themselves so things that might have previously been hidden due to fear or shame suddenly become part of it. And what this will enable us all to do is to have the, the harder, the tougher, the more complex conversations that often happen behind closed doors that people are scared about. But we can bring people in and people will feel more confident and more comfortable having those conversations within our organisations, which will enable them to take the help seeking behaviors that are offered to them and then seek the help that could um, that could support them. All of this lowers um, effective stigma and enables people to seek the help that could give them a better life outcome. And one of the things I just want to finish on before we come into the close is I think we all need to start dropping the mental from mental health. Just start talking about health. Because it is all the same. Becoming a psychologist has taught me anything. It's that our mind and our body are firmly intertwined um, and, in, and inseparable. And we need to treat our mind and our body with the same respect. And we need to, um, we need to just stop pigeonholing and just talk about health because it is all health at the end of the day so where does this all leave me um i finished this research project i'm a qualified uh, psychologist now or when i file the paperwork and over the years of sharing my story giving various talks even writing a book loads of people have asked how can we work together more um Countless people have just wanted to sit and talk with me at the end of a presentation, like go out for a coffee, just share what they're experiencing. And I don't exactly know the future. Um, it is very uncertain. And as I said at the outset, I really struggle with self-promotion. Um, I lack confidence in myself. Um, and therefore, what I'm about to say is incredibly hard for me, but it is incredibly honest um, because it's coming from a place where right now I have, I still have very, very little. Um, and I want 
there to be something more to this so where this is coming from is i need your help i am looking to raise money uh, or to sell services and products um, because i want to further this research i think undertaking a phd to lead the conversation of how professional services can build the best businesses and the best cultures for their people uh, to allow them to thrive and be there be their best is something that needs to happen i think that in the world changing post covid 19 um everything looks different now and the things that we had built as standards before just may not be appropriate and so on um and i think there are ways that we can improve this experience now doing a phd requires a lot of funding and it requires doing a lot of research which requires people and participants to be a part of that so for the first time in ever i suppose i'm asking people their organizations do you want to sponsor this research because i would welcome something like that if you would like to partner with me um we can lead this important conversation that needs to happen i don't want to do this and the results not be heard i want them to be relevant and to be implemented and for people to learn and grow as a result of it um i'd like organizations to get better and how people to interact with them to improve and therefore i'm seeing if people would like to sponsor this and if you would reach out to me contact me but direct sponsorship can be tricky so i'm also going to be offering a kind of joint package of the breaking the stigma presentation coupled with this broken the stigma presentation um, to be presented to either staff in offices or online um, and all of these can be combined with purchasing copies of my book everything that i earn will go towards funding a phd um, to do more research to support more professionals in their daily lives whether it be work or home because i believe we can build better businesses for all of us um, i'm also looking at producing some other content maybe some seminar content kind of deep dives into psychology within business and within people so probably a deep dive into stress maybe into common mental mental ill health like anxiety depression what it means um what all these things are many people come with say a fear of what uh, antidepressants are so i can talk through stuff like that um but again these aren't finalized so if you as an organization or someone within an organization knows something you want presenting to your people i can probably prepare it now i feel confident in my ability to educate in these sort in in this field as well as be the contact intervention to help lower stigma of both categories and finally and this is something that a lot of people have asked for is I want to provide some form of dedicated one-to-one -one support uh, to individuals. Now, I don't know what the term is. There's a lot of protected words out there, um, counselor, therapist, coach. Um, so I don't know what the word is, but there are people that go through things that want to talk about them and I want to give them the ability to talk, whether it's work stress, home stress, whatever. Sometimes you just need to talk to someone that's not connected to it. And I want to provide this, particularly within the context of work, because sometimes people just need 15 minutes, 30 minutes to talk through the problem out of context to then be able to go back and focus on it. Very much that you turn a prolonged stress response into a short term stress response and then recovery. And then people can focus, and put their attention to something and then deliver the exceptional work in a tough context as is expected within the organization. So this is very much about um, supporting people to be their best. Now, whenever I talk about this, whenever I say this about having this within a firm, um, everyone always goes, oh my word, that's just like that person from billions. Why don't we have that? That would be incredible. So I guess that's what I'm offering. To be honest, I haven't watched the show and I probably should. Um, 
Um, but yeah, it's a sort of occupational psychological support to people just to improve, just to help improve people throughout the organization and allow them to be their best. So those are kind of the things I'm passionate about, what I care about, what I want to deliver, what I want to support. But ultimately, I need your help to do it because I cannot keep funding all this. And if it's something you care about, if it's something your business cares about, please do reach out. I am not a great salesman in this. Uh, I'm not a great salesman of myself. I'm probably not doing myself a great justice here. Um, but I do sit at this incredible niche intersection across the UK as a dual chartered psychologist and chartered accountant and able to understand business and people and how they interact. So if you are interested in discussing any of this with me, my inbox is open and you can reach me through my website or through social media or my email address. So I just want to leave you with one final uh, statement and it's the same statement I always leave everyone with. Um, firstly, accept yourself, your flaws, your successes, all of it. Accept that the world is, accept what the world is and your part within it. I have song lyrics tattooed on my arm that read, it's not what I wanted, it's not what I planned, it's not where I thought I'd be, it's just where I am. And this to me is acceptance and I hope everyone in the world can find that level of acceptance within themselves. I still find it hard and I've spent years working on it, but it is something to aspire towards. Uh, secondly, find your happiness, embrace it, but find it in the present. Too much of life can be spent reminiscing over the past or dreaming of the future, and too much time is lost not simply loving what is now. So find your happiness and live it. And finally, as always, just don't be a dick. Thank you. So now is the time I would normally ask people for questions, and there would surely be many. Uh, it often starts with a nervous thank you uh, and a shy question, and then slowly the floodgates open um, as acceptability increases. Um, clearly, I can't do that via a video, um, but if you do have questions about my research, this talk, working together, anything, my website is andysolkel.com. Uh, you can contact me through that uh, or social media. And I look forward to hearing from you and I hope you have found uh, this presentation useful and informative and entertaining. Thank you.